Welcome, everyone, to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast. I'm Amy. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm joined today, as always, by my very inquisitive co-host, uh-huh. Dr. Jason Martin. He's a board-certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Yeah, that's what I am, Amy. You're inquisitive, just like our listeners. Dr. Martin, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Very good. How are you doing? I'm good. So this episode, if you're not watching it on YouTube and you would like to, you can find us on YouTube at Jason Martin MD. And if you are on YouTube, please remember to like and subscribe. Even if you never watch another one of our videos, it would mean a lot to me if you would subscribe. Share us with a friend. You can find all of our social media handles here. And if you'd like to be included in the next episode of questions from listeners or comments, you can shoot me a text. You can leave a comment below. Text us at 303-630-9038 or just leave us a comment. And uh, you could be on the next episode of Beauty and the Surgeon, questions from listeners. Why are you throwing shade to voicemails? Well, I love the voicemails. Okay, you didn't say voicemail. Because no one left one this time. Because <laughs> I don't have one. Yeah. So you guys really came through. I told Nils, our producer, before I start, you know, after the last questions from listeners, I started just collating the questions that were coming in. And by the time... We got ready to record this one. We actually, this is a two-parter. So this is part one of two. So if you were waiting for your question to come up and I told you that we were going to be answering it, just know that there is a part two. So stay tuned in two weeks. That's when yours will be answered if it's not answered on this episode. I don't think a lot of people leave voicemails. Sometimes I'll just leave voicemails to friends just to be annoying. See, I send video messages to everybody because I like them to see me. So without further ado, let's get into our first question from listeners. Let's go. So this is from episode 37. We I mean, were who in is the Wayback Machine. Who is that guy? This was from our episode 37, Tummy is that, Tucks. Nils, is this me? <laughs> from oh my gosh. Bright Viz Vibe. Bright Vibes. Bright, bright Vibes. Bright Vibes yeah. wrote, I like you guys. Just what I have been looking for. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Bright Vibes. And these are her emojis, which I really love. She used the bikini emoji. What do you guys think of people who have health issues having surgery? What do you think of someone who is scared of doing surgery? And what advice and comments do you have for those scenarios? So these are great questions, Bright Vibes. Very good questions. Yes. And I think the very first one, people who have health issues having surgery, as we say in all of our episodes, the number one thing that you need to be a good candidate for surgery is you need to be healthy enough for surgery. So it really depends on the health issue that you're having. So people that have health issues, which is not a small number of our patients, I mean, on a regular basis, people come in with health issues. Most of those won't preclude you for surgery. If you have mild high blood pressure or what's a good, I mean, I don't know if you have autoimmune disease or certain things like that, you know, we could do surgery on you. Uh, If you have other things that are a little bit more critical, we might get preoperative clearance. And that's pretty common too for us, especially for people with cardiac or heart problems. So it really, as Amy says, it depends on really what's going on with you or what kind of um, health issues you're having. But the ones that aren't okay are the ones that are caused by behaviors that aren't okay. If you're a chronic smoker and you have lung problems, you're not going to be a candidate for surgery. If you're a diabetic and you don't take insulin and your hemoglobin A1C is high, you're not going to be a candidate for surgery. So I think it really relates to your overall health status versus the health issues themselves. Correct. And that's why we always say healthy enough for surgery. It doesn't mean that you're without issues. It just means you're healthy enough for surgery, for yeah, elective surgery. For elective surgery. Uh, people who are afraid of having surgery, I would we tell our patients that uh, people who are not afraid of surgery Those kind of scare ones, us. They weird us out. Yes. Yeah, like every, <laughs> uh, it's elective, you know, I mean, it's, I it's had, your body. I, we, we both had surgery mm-hmm. and I was nervous before I went in yeah. and I picked the surgeon. He's a friend of mine. Yeah. So like it, it's normal. Yeah. Like that's a normal thing. I mean, being afraid of surgery is normal. Uh, you got to risk versus benefit is what it comes down to. You got to sometimes you don't have a choice. If surgery is non elective, you got to just tough it up and do it. <laughs> the fear for most people going into surgery usually relates to things that are very serious. Like, am I going to make it through the surgery? Oh, and, or pain. I think most yeah. people are afraid of pain. And in pain. And number one, from a standpoint of doing surgery and making it through, the, the data shows that that is very, very highly likely. And we talk about this all the time. Amy said this before. I've said it to patients that you're more likely to get in a car wreck and be injured there than you are with... On your way to the surgery center yeah, than you are to have with the surgery. A complication yeah, exactly. Anesthesia. So... Um, it's hard to parse that out in your brain, but that's the truth. Um, and in terms of pain, it really is spe- specific to the surgery itself. Do we have an episode on pain in surgery and what to expect? Don't we have one? We talk about it in all of our episodes, yeah. you know, about pain management. But the other thing that I think people get nervous about, let's say nervous, not scared, uh, is the outcome, right? 
you're changing something. And we talk a lot about that. Actually, uh, I don't get nervous about that, Amy. Our episode about uh, things you wish you knew before rhinoplasty, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. We talk a lot about the psychological after effects of surgery. And that's also a fear that some people have going in. Like, what if it's worse? Mm-hmm. You know, what if I don't like the outcome? What if I look weird? You know, those are things that people can be very concerned about as well. And that's where having a really good relationship with your surgical team and your doctor is really key. Yeah. So, so those are my advice and comments. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And uh, I was talking to someone about this about with facelifts. So it's pretty much true for almost any surgery you're going to do that's elective and cosmetic or for plastic surgery is that your vision has to align with the surgeon's vision. And the only way you can find that out is to meet with them and actually have a real conversation. And meet with multiple surgeons. Right. You might not know that someone doesn't match your aesthetic goals until you meet someone who doesn't. Completely. <laughs> like, oh, I get it. Yeah. This is not my person. We actually prefer the patients get multiple yes. consults. It actually helps us out. Well, it helps them too. Like we don't, not every patient is the right fit for us and vice versa. So yeah, that would be my advice. Get some, get a lot of consults. Don't be worried. I was wearing the sport coat back then. Yeah. You know, it must have just been that day. All right. Thank you so I much. I wore it all the time. There were a couple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So our next one was on episode 47, which was arm lift or brachioplasty. With a mini brachioplasty, is the skin visible that it has been stretched? This was from Adriana Barroso, 5317. Mm. And then also we had from Eliana Varez Diaz. I'm so sorry if I butcher these usernames, 8612. What about brachioplasty for lipedema in the upper arms? Yeah. So two very different questions. So with a mini brachioplasty, is the skin visibly stretched? That's the first question. So uh, we have a great episode uh, even more recent than this, right? Or no? This uh, was episode 47. Yeah, we've, oh, ha- yeah. we've had brachioplasty. All right, so he's going to show that one here. I oh. think, yeah, you can look at that one. That's actually, maybe we had a miss busting episode about brachioplasty. We've had a really good one. But uh, we talk about in the more recent one, the difference between a full and mini brachioplasty. That's why I'm bringing that up. We talk about it in this episode as well. I think we had better drawings and and uh, diagrams. Anyways, so a mini brachioplasty at, at best will affect the upper third of your arm. The incision is in the armpit area, and sometimes a small part of it goes out along the axis of your arm. Uh, it really only helps. Amy, how would you describe it? Yeah, you described it very well, the first third of the arm. Yeah, so the area that kind of dips down. And it really won't solve the problem on the whole arm. A lot It doesn't of people, get the bat wing. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people come in with like full arm problems. They want a mini brachioplasty because they don't want a visible scar. And it's just not going to work, unfortunately. Mini brachioplasties are for a very small set of patients. And is the skin vi- visibly, is when you pull that skin with a mini brachioplasty, does the skin look stretched? Or is she asking, does it cause stretch marks? No, or? that's, I think, the question. And that's, I think, what when people do it on themselves, it looks very stretched because they're pulling harder than we can actually like pull. Yeah. It doesn't look like that. Yeah. And you really, you can't pull up enough. I mean, think about what I have patients do is put your arm completely straight up over your head and grab the loose skin and then put your arm back down. And that's what you're going to get. It's not putting your arm down as far as you can, pulling as hard as you can, and then keeping your arm there. Try and move your arm up. I mean, like you can't. So that pulled appearance. What she's is, saying is you got to have enough <laughs> range of motion. Put your right? arm over your head. <laughs> have, the skin's so tight that you can't lift your arm. Correct. Yeah. But that's what, I mean, I get that. Like if you're, sta- if you have your arm static and you're pulling, it's going to look really stretched because you're pulling so much harder than yeah. we can actually pull. And so. even with a regular break of plastic, because you're doing it circumferentially around the arm, even if you pull tight, you're not going to see a super st- stretched appearance. So yeah. um, it doesn't look stretched, nope. but. The scars for brachioplasty, which is the big concern for people, do heal really well if it's done correctly. And in in our experience, anecdotally, obviously, the patients are very happy with the results. They're not coming back and say, I wish the scar looked different. So a brachioplasty, full brachioplasty done correctly, actually should heal really well. Um, and the mini also too, but it's just it doesn't do as much as you want it to do. Now, you can combine a mini brachioplasty with body tight or some sort of liposuction with energy procedure, which is kind of a nice hybrid procedure. But even those kind of patients is few and far between. Yeah. Which actually, I mean, the next question asking about lipedema, uh, lipedema is a process where the body is essentially kind of adding excess like lipotic cells, the fat cells in an area uh, very unusually. So it's a very unusual fat distribution. And do they have 
more edematous kind of symptoms also, like more they lymphedema can, kind of well, symptoms Well, lymphedema too? and lipedema are different. I know they're different. But yeah. they usually are concomitant. Yeah, like oh. You usually do experience at yeah. least parts of one or the other. So to address lipedema is a little bit different because there's more fat you know, than, than there would normally be in that area. Right. Historically, in plastic surgery, you can do liposuction for lipedema. Um, so, and, and, and we, we don't do, we don't accept insurance in our office, but in some cases, insurance may even cover it if there's a, like a medical need for that. Um, but re- in reality, removal of the skin and soft tissue, which is the fat, probably would have a better result. Yes. Like but, actual removal versus yeah. liposuction but alone. But then you're affecting the lymphatic drainage. So if you also have lymphedema there, um, you're going to confound the problem, actually. It could make it worse. It could make it worse. So this is actually a really interesting mm-hmm. question that's kind of tricky. I feel like this is a board examiner. I know, right? I mean, but there's, it really depends on your fat distribution and your previous medical history, what the best course of action is going to be. And I would say that, yes, is it a, is it a possibility? Absolutely. But you definitely would need to go to somebody who has some experience treating this yep. condition and so that you don't end up making it worse, especially in the arms. You know, you don't want to destroy or or limit the ability for the lymphatic system to drain appropriately. I mean, you see this, Dr. Martin, in patients when they used to have really radical mm-hmm. lymph removal with breast cancer. Oh, yeah. And they would have terrible like compartment syndrome and lymphedema. Yeah, and, lymphedema is really yeah. problematic. Uh, lymphedema can be really a huge problem, too. So I, I, I feel for patients. And there are yeah. centers that actually treat lipedema. Yes. So if you just Google that into your center or your area where you are, you should be able to find an expert. But to answer this question, a brachioplasty would help, assume, could help. Yeah. assuming that you can still maintain the lymphatic drainage mm-hmm. of this area. Yeah. So those are great questions. I love those. Nils has a question. No, we have a great brachioplasty myths episode from one year ago. Oh, That's perfect. the one. 143. Yeah. It's great. Myths. Yeah. It's a really good episode. Perfect. See, I know all the episodes, Nils. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a Rolodex. It's a Rolodex up here. All right. So now we're getting into more recent episodes. This one was from episode 170, Everything You Need to Know About Breast Reduction Part 2. And we had two questions. Uh, The first one was from Nancy2U2. I am a double D and would like to know, realistically, can I be a B cup or is that too much breast tissue to remove? The other question was from Zoe B123, which was so helpful. Thank you for sharing your expertise. So this was a, a great question, Nancy. And how much you can be reduced isn't just based on your cup size. It's really about your 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 breast size overall. Because someone could be a 32 double D and getting them down to a 32 B, I think would be very realistic. Sure. In a lot of cases. Yeah. But if you're a, a like a 40 double D, getting down to a 40 B might be a little more challenging. And what Amy's referring to is the circumference of your chest and and how that relates to the cup size and everything well, else. Well, to the breast yeah, size. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's really about that breast width. I mean, right. narrowing in a really wide double D versus narrowing in a really a more narrow or compact double D. Exactly. Very different. And also the aesthetic outcome of that. Mm-hmm. So if you think about breast reduction, it's one of the few surgeries we do that has a medical benefit and also an aesthetic benefit. And a and, psychological benefit. Yeah, There's so many that's benefits. That's like for every single one. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't always align. You can do a medically beneficial reduction that doesn't make it aesthetically where the patient wants. You can do an aesthetically beneficial reduction that doesn't have the medical benefit. Or the the just the benefit that the patient wants. And then you get deep down into the weeds with the SNR calculations and all this stuff. Go back and watch these episodes. And you'll see that it gets kind of complicated. But for sure... You know, someone who's a double D could probably go to a high B mm-hmm. re- realistically high B, yeah. if they're not, the breast isn't too wide. And the reason that is, is because you, if your breast is so wide, remember the volume that creates that B cup. If it's so wide, then you would have minimal projection and would look like pancakey and flat. And that's not what we want for outcomes. We want a breast that has really nice, beautiful contour, some upper pull above the nipple and areola fullness, a nice rounding of the bottom. Something that when you look in the mirror without a bra on, you could be really proud of. So it, it really does depend on your exam. Mm-hmm. Um, but double D to B is possible. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. Well, hold on. Yeah. Zoe B, thank you. You're, thank you uh, We so appreciate much. your nice yes. comment. I love it. This they, These episodes about breast reaction are really, really good. It was a two-parter. Obviously, this was part two, so... Yes. So keeping on with the breast reduction, we have one from the OG breast reduction episode 63. How obese should one not be to go for a reduction? And this was from Jehovah is King 2928. 
Okay. Love it. So the Amy, what's the BMI cutoff we usually use? We use 30. Yeah. There are potentially this is and when I answered this, I did say this to to her that, you know, depending on your body size, th- these we have patients whose breast size is so large that it really throws off their BMI. Right. So that can sometimes be a bit of a challenging metric to go by. And that's where, you know, we say 30 kind of as our cutoff. However, you know, if you were maybe like 32, but your breasts were really large, you might make it. And that's where BMI is not a great marker, but it's one we have to use. So and it's what we use in healthcare, yeah. both on the insurance side and the cosmetic side. Yeah. So, Amy, if someone wanted to calculate their BMI, what, what would they do? There's Google BMI, yep, BMI calculator. BMI calculator. Okay. You put your height and weight in and it tells you, you know, height, weight and uh, gender. And it's going to tell you what your BMI is. And BMI is, a, is again, there's flaws there. But unfortunately, especially with something with a, like a breast reduction, if you are trying to go through insurance, they are going to want your BMI. And that could be a reason that they decline it. However, that's where pictures are great. And that's why your doctor will likely take pictures of you to support the, the cause you know, if, if your breast reduction is very minimal and your BMI is very high, your, your chances are not very good. Now, you could be a very petite person, have very large breasts. Your BMI might be artificially elevated like it can be with like bodybuilders, like people who carry a lot of muscle mass are also going to have a high BMI to their visual size. So what's the uh, term? I'm sorry, because this is so your world. The term when you it, 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 it it's encompasses all the things you do, like physical therapy, like massage. Oh, cam. Cam. Complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, CAMs. Yep, okay, CAM. yeah. So the, those CAMs are super important yes. to- Chiropractic, massage. Yeah, insurance yeah. companies. Do you take ibuprofen on a regular basis? Do you Have you had an MRI that shows or cervical x-rays. or thoracic spine or even lumbar spine problems? Mm-hmm. Um, x-rays, chiropractor, acupuncture. I mean, it's a yep. lot of stuff. It's so many things. Yep. Yeah. Massage therapy, OT. I mean, people can have you know thoracic outlet syndrome from carrying large breasts. Chronic migraines. Yep. There's, there's so many different things. So breast reduction is an amazing surgery. We said this in this in this episode it was a really good episode because it's the most transformative surgery we do in terms of people's lives and quality of life. Um, and it just really, the patients are super happy. So yeah. if you are a candidate, yeah. Jo- Jehovah is King 2928, uh, and you're a little bit past that BMI mark, you know, see if you can drop that weight and get to where you would do the surgery because it is life changing. Yeah. Great question. Love that. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have more comments and questions. And we're back. All right. So this next one was actually on a listener voicemail, questions and comments, episode 175. Love it. This is from Jody Renshaw. Hi there. Thank you so very much for these videos. I have a question for your next Q&A. Please and thank you. Love it. Please and thank you are the magic words, <laughs> says Barney. I love many. I watch many surgeons on social media. I am searching for ways to improve my aging face after very significant weight loss. I was looking into Sculptra, but find that many of the doctors I watch give very different takes on whether one can have Sculptra and still have a facelift later in life. It seems very controversial. Doctors love making things controversial. Yeah, Social media loves oh. making things controversial. And I just want an unbiased answer. And sometimes I like you wonder when they're answering these questions, because I've seen a few of these kind of videos, like, are they just saying the contrarian thing? Maybe. Yeah. I If I was to use Sculptra on my temples and in front of the ears, cheek area, would that make a facelift hard for me in the future? Thank you endlessly. I love this. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, this is a good question. So this is a great question. Sculptra is, if for those who don't know, Sculptra yeah. is a filler. It's a, but it's a filler that's injected right on top of the fascia. So it's this really deep filler that is permanent. It's and it builds on itself. So it kind of you you they place it and then it kind of draws in collagen and builds a foundation and then they can add more and more and more right over the course of many months. Right. But it's permanent. Yes. Yeah. So. Is I mean, if you are going to have a face and neck lift, like you know you're going to have it. Then there's really probably no reason to do sculpture right now. I would wait and do it afterwards. Yeah, you're because, trying to fill an empty balloon, right? Because you, you're going to spend a lot of money, and then all the whatever benefits, which is it's not going to be drastic. It's going to be subtle. From scul- sculpture is great, but it's this very subtle change. You well, could, or if it isn't, then you could just do a face and neck lift. I mean, to be honest with you, but if you're t- if you're young, I don't know how old you are, but exactly, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you're younger and you want to do sculpture, great, it's fine. 
And the reason why I know you can do face and neck lifts with Sculptra is that I do face and neck lifts all the time and the people have had Sculptra before and it, it works just fine. Yep. Sometimes you get in the little areas that are problems and you do surgery stuff and it's okay and you move on. So it is not going to stop you from doing a facelift. It's not going to make a facelift impossible or future su- surgery impossible. Yeah. So each is true. That's the problem with the truth is that usually it's somewhere in the middle that you can get sculpture. It's not maybe perfect for a facelift, but it shouldn't stop you from doing a facelift and your results are going to be just as good as they were if you didn't have sculpture. Um, and some, you could argue sculpture might help the facelift a little bit because it'll help the deeper layer and give you more volume. There. I would still do the facelift first. Me too. Just because if you, like Dr. Martin said, if, if you are at all a candidate for a facelift, doing it now, I mean, I go back to my couch cushion. So rather than just add a ton more stuffing when the when the cushion still needs to be replaced, right, when the fabric is still all shredded, you can stuff it back up, but it still doesn't look good. You know, fixing the cover first. You, you, you beat that couch to death. But it works. I mean, Everybody gets it. And then, then adding the volume. And perhaps at the time of surgery, even though you've lost a lot of weight, you could have a little bit of fat transfer to those areas. And I get it. Like those temple areas can look really hollowed out when you yeah. lost a lot of weight. Um but doing the facelift first and then adding to the foundation versus trying to fill a foundation that's way too voluminous already. It's got there's too much space, you know, and then trying voluminous. to do the face. What did you what word did you say? Voluminous. 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 Yeah. Well, it's it's voluminous. Voluminous. <laughs> <laughs> it's voluminous. <laughs> you said it's sassy. Yeah. yeah See, yeah. if you say it with conviction, <laughs> um, it's not voluminous. It's voluminous. It's voluminous. It's voluminous. It's voluminous. Uh, with Z's at the end. Uh, like all the space. I will tell you, the temple area is not usually violated. Uh, I got to stop using medical words. It's not usually involved in face and neck lifts. Yeah. So you could do your temples. And that's a really good area for sculpture, by yeah. the way. But also an even better area for fat transfer. You can do fat transfer in the office awake under local anesthesia. We do it all the time in our office. So, you know, maybe look into fat transfer. Uh, it shouldn't be that much more expensive. And you have just as so much permanence with a fat transfer if it's done correctly. Yeah. Do we have an episode on fat transfer? We talk a lot about fat transfer in go. our face. Check this episodes. one out. Uh, Aging yeah. like a Hollywood superstar. We talk about it too. There you go. Yeah. Yep. So great question, Jody. Thank you so much. And thank you for being such a fan. Yeah. Love it. Good job, Jody. So this was also on the same episode. This is episode 175, listener voicemails and questions. Oh, uh, from Nashville. Is this the same one? The caller from Nashville? She's the caller from Nashville. Oh, yeah. The one that didn't leave her name. I mean, I don't know if that's the same person. There could be more than one person. I think the, that one. She said, I name. am the caller from Nashville. I mean. Oh, that. Oh, that part. Yes. OK. Yes. <laughs> I'm reading the, one, the slide. My name is Kendra. Yeah. OK. <laughs> I thought you meant the last one. I'm like, how do you do it? I'm like, how do you know she's from Nashville? No, the one we're yeah. talking about now. Yes. The one we're talking about right now is. So this is Kendra from Nashville. She had RNY surgery about two years ago and maintaining a 135 pound weight loss. That's awesome. Wow. Let's go. The surgery that I am planning next is a bra line back lift. Mm-hmm. I am almost six months post-op from the extended tummy tuck and brachioplasty, and I'm scheduled for the back lift in three months. Right. I had a wonderful plastic surgeon and am thrilled with the results, especially the arms. Wearing short sleeves for the first time in my life. I'm an NP, and I try to educate my patients about the importance of making sure they go to a board-certified plastic surgeon for Preach. procedures. Preach. We love MPs. We love APPs. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Love it. And yeah. we also, I told her in the comments, like, Dr. Martin was right. I said he's going to be so excited to know that he was right because it was a brawl line back plastic. I'm always right. Not a body lift. If I'm being honest, Amy's mostly right, but I'm always right. Well, back back lift could go either way. You know, you just, you don't know. But yeah, I told her when I wrote back to her, like the Dr. Martin was right. So he's going to love it. I'm down with the MPs. Yeah. It was awesome. So Kendra, congratulations and good luck on your next surgery too. Yeah. Super awesome. That's awesome. Oh, that's amazing. By the way, the brawl line plastics, Kenda, Kenda or Kendra, whatever. Kenda. Kenda. I like, I even like that better. So Kenda. Uh, the bra line plasties are really transformative too. Uh, people are really happy with those results. It, you, you know, the scar is something you have to deal with, but it's just really can make a big difference for clothing and things that you wear. Yeah. So you're going to be super happy with it. Exactly. All right. This one I love. As you can tell by the picture, Dr. Martin. Did a candy corn. Oh. Well, this, hey, Sarah made these slides. <laughs> so this is from Jenny. So it's like, good morning, Amy. Oh my God. This is Jenny. She texted me. Candy corn and planters roasted peanuts. LOL. Love it. I'm going in tomorrow for my lower body lift, and I wanted to reach out and say, uh, I pray the recovery isn't as hard as I'm thinking. I'm excited and terrified. Thank you, Dr. Martin, Nils, and your staff family for being here. 
You are all helping us through the process and what to expect from our bodies. My blood work looks better than it did before my first set of surgeries. And I know it's because I took your recommendations for nutrition. Yep. So Jenny has been awesome. So she has we've we've texted back and forth a few times and she is recovering beautifully. How was Uh, it? I mean, this we all want to know. How was it? So she's been, she's doing great. Like okay. she's doing awesome. amazing. And she so she did the lower body lift, but she also did fat transfer to the glutes. So she and I have been talking about, you know, kind of the the weirdness of asymmetries and the way the glutes look. And yeah. I told her about the booty pillow, the bombshell booty cushion. So she's been amazing. Like I'm so I, it's been so great um, texting with you, Jenny. And it's candy corn season right now and I'm on prep. So there will be no candy corn for me uh, for the time being. But oh, even just seeing the picture. Love it. Love candy corn. Oh, candy corn. Can we put my candy corn? uh Stuff you back up. Your Martin Yeah, my Squishmallow. I will. Yeah. There it is. Oh, love it. Is that what that was? Yeah, that was. Well, you wanted the candy corn no, Squishmallow. You wanted the Squishmallow with her face, her face on, on it. So I didn't I was know. Trying to find. I didn't and you did a candy corn. He did a like candy a corn. monster, but I did find a <laughs> pumpkin latte that looked a lot like a candy corn. Little Photoshop. There little you go. This, there you, you know. Go. You know me. I'm gonna put the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you came with candy it. corn, I love it. It's I was amazing. wondering when that was. That's perfect. It was candy corn. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. Candy corn. Candy corn. Candy corn. Ah, oh, Jenny, awesome. All right. So, back to a question. This was from Breast Enhancement Without Implants. This was episode 83. Oh, I remember this one. This was a good episode. So I heard you say in this episode. This is from Carrie Childress 6257. Yeah. So I heard you say in this episode that the best result will be maybe a full cup size at best. At my heaviest, I was 265 with a small C full B. Now I'm down to 140. That is amazing. Yeah, that's pretty Lost awesome. Lost 125 pounds. Yeah. Wow. With a decent B cup, which is also amazing. While I don't mind the current size or the minimal droopiness I have while standing up straight, when I lean forward, I get the ball in a sock situation. I'm saving money for a full extended tummy tuck after having my arms done in August, which is awesome. Would adding a lift and a fat transfer to my breast be a good option for me if I just want to maintain a full B or C? My fear would be getting a lift and ending up with an A cup. Thank you for your time and love the show. Yeah. So, really good question, yes. actually. I think in these kind of scenarios, the lift is a net positive. I really, really do. Especially with the bending over. Right. Because that ptosis or that droopiness, that tennis ball in the sock situation, it's only going to get worse, unfortunately. It's not going to get any better. You're, you're already at 140. It's an absolute miracle. I mean, kudos to you. Congratulations. So. Once those Cooper, Cooper's ligaments have been stretched, they've been They're stretched. They're not going back. Nope. Yeah. And so when you lift it up, they can do it, or well, the way we do it at least, you can do it in a way that you really don't take out any tissue. And then that, that's an excellent opportunity for fat transfer mm-hmm. at the same time. Hopefully, wherever you are in the in the area that you live in, the surgeons can offer that. And I think that would be a great add-on, especially if you're adding it on to other body procedures where they're going to be doing liposuction, they can reuse that fat for the fat yeah. transfer. Yeah. And if you if you have realistic expectations of just kind of maintaining your size or going up a little bit in fullness, like that's perfect. That is the ideal candidate for a fat, fat totally. transfer. Yeah. I almost said fat transfer. Fat, fat, fat transfer for a fat transfer. Fat. 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 <laughs> that's with pH. So, Yes. Carrie, I think you are probably an awesome candidate for a lift with a fat transfer. And like Dr. Warren said, it's not a reduction. You can do a lift without reducing the size, especially a full cup size would be a pretty drastic reduction. So when I do lifts, just so you can put this in your mind, I only take out skin, like Mm -hmm. none of the soft tissue, none of the fat, nothing else. Just rotate it up. Yeah. And just rotate everything around. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of an interesting surgery. Yeah. We have a great, uh, our episodes on mastopexy. Definitely check those out because we kind of explain that in more detail when we show pictures of the flap. Yeah. Very cool. Did we did I draw that or was it? Yeah, uh, we we had pictures. I don't know if you drew it, but we have pictures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah. So that wraps up part one. These were amazing, especially the candy corn. Yep. As you can tell, I'm a fan. So if you do want to be included, episode two is going to be coming out in two weeks, but we'll do another one. And with the way you guys sent questions in after this last one, I'm really excited. And the th- best part about these episodes is that we get to know what you have questions right. about. Like yes. you listen to the episode. Yeah. Here's a question. And your questions are all so oh, good. So good. Oh, at part two, there's some really good ones. I told Dr. Riley, there's some that we've- This is what you call a teaser. We have never heard some of these questions before. And I was like, wow. So definitely tune in in two weeks to part two. And in the meantime, if you would like to leave me a voicemail, 303-630-9038, or you can text me like Jenny does, uh, or you can leave us a comment in the description or in the comments below. Share us, like us with a friend. Like so should I just us? take the uh, voicemail, the Google phone number instead of your regular phone number and just start texting you through that? Do you, is this? Uh, it goes to my phone. Oh, okay. So it doesn't really matter to me. Okay. I like, yeah, I mean, either one. Okay. I'd prefer you text me the way you usually do. 
Okay. Because, yeah, just because. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And we will see you here for part two in two weeks. Come join us.